If you'll find 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in your copy of the Scriptures, if you're using one of the Bibles that we just have sitting out there for you, turn to page 954. That's the fastest way to find 1 Corinthians chapter 4 or find it on your phone or whatever it is that you're using this morning. We've already started chapter 4, and we're moving further into chapter 4 this morning, and so we're going to pick up in verse 6 and read down through verse 13, so a little more than halfway through chapter 4 by the time that we finish this morning. So if you have found that place, I'd like you to stand again to your feet in honor of God's Word as we read together. Paul writes, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. So that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute to the present hour. We hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. God, thank you for this word. Teach us through it now, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Paul says in verse 6, we've applied all these things, all this stuff that I have been saying, I have applied to myself and also to Apollo. So if you're just now jumping in to chapter 4 in 1 Corinthians, then you're probably a little bit confused. First of all, who's Apollos? Second of all, what things? (laughs) What things has Paul been applying? What exactly has been his main theme throughout the first three chapters all the way up through the first few verses of chapter 4? What is it that Paul has been focused upon and, and what is it that he is applying to himself in this fellow named Apollos? Well, first of all, you have to know something about Paul and Apollos. They are not enemies. They are co-workers. They are not in competition with one another. They are in partnership with one another. Paul had started started the church at Corinth. He had planted that church. He had gone into the city and preached the gospel in a place where the gospel had never been proclaimed. He went in, he preached the gospel, and he stayed some almost two years, at least a year and a half there, trying to get that new fledgling church up on its feet and, and solid. And after he left... Apollos began teaching in Corinth. Apollos was an an elegant speaker, a gifted teacher of the Bible, so that the Corinthians had the privilege of having their church started by the Apostle Paul. That's, I mean, that's quite a privilege. And then not only that, but they had one of the most eloquent teachers and expositors of the scriptures of the first century as one of their very early leaders to follow up on the Apostle Paul. They they had had good, solid teaching. And yet, now that Apollos and Paul are no longer there, the church is in a bit of disarray. There are divisions in the church. They are competing with one another. They've not seen the, uh, the example of Paul and Apollos who are not in competition. They, in fact, are in competition with one another. Who's the most gifted? Who's the wisest? In fact, what they've done is they've, they've imported into the church the values of the culture around them. And if you remember, I've said this several times just as we've walked through the first three chapters of this book that... That in Corinth, 
in the first century, wisdom was a highly prized commodity. And by wisdom, I mean the wisdom of the philosophers. Athens is just down the road a little bit, right? And so they live in an area, in a region that is famous for its philosophers, for its speakers. And so they prize wisdom, but not just wisdom. They prize that which is perceived to be wisdom by the world and the culture around them. And they, they crave the the admiration, they crave being recognized as those who are wise. They crave that. That's what the culture values. The culture values those who are perceived to be wise and eloquent speakers. And so now they've imported that mindset into the church. And so they've begun to kind of compete with one another, divide with one another, even though Paul and Apollos are co-workers They've now begun to say, some of them, well, I, I'm a Paul guy. I'm with Paul. And others, well, I'm with Apollos. And so these divisions have arisen because they've allowed the, the culture to influence the church. And so Paul says, I've applied some things to myself and to Apollos for your benefit. And if you look just back up to the beginning of verse 4, you get a good idea of what he means by these things. So he says in chapter 4, verse 1, This is how one should regard us, talking of himself and Apollos, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And so the things that Paul has applied to himself and Apollos are these truths that they are servants, not masters. They are stewards, that is, they are entrusted with taking care of something that doesn't belong to them. They're not the owners of the church. They're not the owners of God's people or the gifts that God gives to his people. He says, think about us, think about me, think about Apollos, the other leaders of the church. Regard us as nothing more than servants. And so he's reminding them, I've I've said this and I've applied this to myself and Apollos, but for your benefit, because what I want you to do is I want you to take those same truths and I want you to apply them to yourselves. The solution to the problem of the division and the boasting and all the things that are happening in the church at Corinth, the solution is that they began to see themselves the way that Paul sees himself as a servant, as a steward. As a manager, not a master. In fact, that becomes clear as he moves on. He says, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers. And here it is. That you may learn not to go beyond what is written. So we'll come back to that in just a second. Don't go beyond what's written. And then secondly, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Right, You can kind of hear in that language, don't be boastful, don't be puffed up in favor, favoring one person within the church over another. That is, elevating one person above another person over here. Whether it be yourself or someone that you kind of attached yourself to, don't elevate yourself or anyone else above someone else. Don't be boastful, puffed up, prideful in those kinds of ways. Don't do those things. Don't be a boastful person, he says. And the, key, the secret, the key there is don't go beyond what is written. Well, he's quoted the Old Testament in the first three chapters of this letter six times. Two times, actually, in each chapter, he has quoted from the Old Testament. So there's no doubt that when he talks about the things that are written, he's ta- not talking about his own letter. He's not talking about someone else's writing. He's talking about the scriptures themselves and specifically the themes that he's highlighted from what we would call the Old Testament, what he just thought of as his Bible. So let me show you what those are. Let me just hit some of these highlights here of these verses that he's quoted. So if you just want to turn back a page in your Bible to chapter 1, in verse 19, we get the first Old Testament quotation. And it is, he says, for it is written... I will, this is from Isaiah chapter 29, 
I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. You can see how a verse like that would apply to a people who are obsessed with being viewed by other people as wise. Oh, you're wise. Really? God says, I'll destroy the wise. That's, that'll cause you to slow down. Or move down to verse 31. You get a quote from the book of Jeremiah. Let the one who boasts. Okay, here's boasting again. You're going to boast? Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Not in yourself. Not in your favorite teacher. Not in your accomplishments. Not in your gifts. No. If you're going to boast, make sure that you boast in the Lord. Or move down to chapter 2, verse 9. He comes back to Isaiah again. And he writes, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. And the point of this quotation is to highlight the reality that God reveals truth. Not you. God has revealed things. God makes things known. You are not, in your wisdom, capable of discovering great truths. God reveals truth. Or, down at the very end of that chapter, verse 16, For who has understood the mind of the Lord? So as to instruct him. Isaiah again. You see how the emphasis here in all of these quotations is upon this idea of recognizing that God's wisdom comes from God alone, and that God does not regard human wisdom as Anything to be boasted in. I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise. You want to boast? Boast in me. Where does wisdom come from? True wisdom comes from me. Over and over, he's hitting on this same theme. And then your two quotations in chapter 3 come near the end of that chapter. If you want to jump down to chapter 3, I'm going to jump in at verse 19 so you can see some context here. He's going to quote from Job, and he's going to quote from the Psalms. Verse 19, the wisdom of this world, there it is again, is folly with God, for it is written. Here comes Job. He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, here comes Psalm 94. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. And then Paul comments, so let no one boast in men. Are you catching on here that, I mean, this really is... The big concern, this is the driving force of the problems of the church in Corinth, and it is a church with real problems, right? We didn't invent church problems later on. We're not the first generation to look around us and go, man, church seems kind of, you know, divided in places. I mean, we've got all these different churches and all these different denominations. It seems we're not the, we're not the first group of people to see division arise within the church. It happens very early on, and it happens really early on because let's not forget that we Christians are just sinners who have been rescued by the grace of God. Right? We are no no more equipped or capable on our own of creating some sort of large or small organization that has no cracks in it and never falls apart and never runs into trouble because we're just as sinful as anyone else. And yet God, by His grace, has saved us. And really that knowledge should be the foundation, not for boasting, but for understanding ourselves as those who've received mercy and grace. This is why Jesus is described over and over as humble and calls us to consider ourselves humble. We have a humble master. And he calls us over and over and over to imitate him and to recognize that we are only among his people because of his mercy and grace. And so Paul says, look, guys, I've applied all this stuff to myself and Apollos. View us as servants. But it was for your benefit. So that you would not go beyond what is written. So that you would learn the lesson from all of these passages that I keep throwing out, that I'm quoting to you, that you've heard before. You need to learn the lesson from the scriptures. Don't be puffed up in favor of one against another. 
Now, if that's not enough to sort of drive the point home that Paul's trying to make... He goes on, if you move further down in this passage that we've already read, he goes on to describe in more detail what it means for him to be viewed as a servant, right? Paul does not conduct his life and his ministry as one who is owed anything. Paul doesn't conduct his life and his ministry as one who demands respect and honor from everyone else around him. In fact, Paul is an example of just the opposite of those things. I have heard people comment before from reading Paul's letters that Paul seems arrogant. Paul seems to be full of himself. Paul seems to always think that he has the answers. And that's not an accurate portrait of the Apostle Paul at all. When he speaks with confidence, he's speaking the things that the Lord has made known to him and the things that he's learned from God's Word. When he speaks of the Gospel, he speaks with boldness. But if you'll notice, when Paul speaks of himself, he speaks with humility and self-abasement. Let's take a look at a little bit of that. Let's jump down. I, I want to jump down a little bit to, um, to verse 11. Just listen to this description of Paul This is how he thinks of himself and the other apostles. Okay, He says, To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed. And that could be translated actually naked. And it's the idea of we don't have the robes and fine clothing that you have. All we have are our underwear, basically. Undergarments. We're poorly dressed. We're buffeted. That means beaten, smacked around. We're buffeted. And homeless. We labor, working with our own hands. Now pause for a moment there because I think we could miss the significance of this. Paul, as an apostle, had a right given to him in the scriptures to demand that the churches where he served pay him. He had a right to that given to him by scripture. And yet, he never made use of that right. In fact, the only money that we know of that the Apostle Paul collected, he collected to take to other Christians who were suffering from a famine. This is Paul. We work with our own hands. He was a a tent maker. and he, He would have worked with fabrics and leathers and things like that, which actually is difficult work, rough on the hands. Rough on the hands of a man who was trained from childhood to have delicate hands and gently unroll scrolls and teach the people of Israel. This was not a man raised to rough it. But when he came to Christ, he set all of that aside. And he says, we're tired all the time because we work with our own hands. This is Paul's experience of apostolic ministry. He's hungry. He's naked. He's beaten and and mistreated. Works with his own hands and he's tired all the time. But that's not all. When reviled, when people insult us and slander us, because it happens a lot to Paul, we bless When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat or encourage. We have become, this is his summary statement, all right? Listen carefully. This is his summary statement of what it's like to be an apostle, okay? So when you drive by an ornate church building, the name of apostle so-and-so on it, and he drives the nicest car in the parking lot, know that he doesn't know what it means to really be an apostle in the biblical sense. Here it is. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Now this is actually very graphic language. The streets of Corinth in any major city in the first century would have been 
at many times really gross and grimy. Okay? Now, the Romans did invent what we would think of as plumbing. If you were a wealthy Roman, you had some sort of plumbing system. Not like we have, but some sort of plumbing system in your home. But the normal, average person that lived in a city like Corinth did not have anything like that. So where did everything go? In the streets. That's where it went. And when the rain came and the water mixed and the mud mixed, it was gross. I'll leave it at that, okay? And what Paul is essentially saying is, when you come into your home from walking on the streets and you scrape that mixture, that crusty, nasty mixture off your shoe and sweep it out the door, that's what we have become. That's what I am. That's what the apostles have become for your sake. When he calls himself a servant, he means that in a deep way. All the things that he has suffered, all the things that he has endured, all the things that he will suffer and endure after writing this letter, he does for their sake. And he's saying to them, learn from our example. You are built on a foundation. He says the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You are built on a foundation made up of men who have become the scum and refuse of the world. And you would stand upon that foundation and boast and argue about who among you is the greatest and most gifted? About who should have greater rights within the church? You've missed it. Now, I love the way that Paul, this is kind of hard stuff, I get it, okay? But I love the way that Paul really presses this in when he asks them a series of questions. If you look in, in verse 7, Paul is going to ask these Corinthians who have a problem with boasting, he's going to ask them three questions, a who question, a what question, and a why question. Those are the three questions he's going to ask. So just look at those real quickly in verse 7. He says this, Who sees anything different in you? Now that is a very difficult phrase to actually figure out how to put into English. It really is. Sometimes when you go from one language to another, it's just hard. So it's something along the lines of, who's making a difference between you guys? Like, who's distinguishing one person from another within the church? Who's doing that? Who's elevating one person over another? Who's, who's making these kinds of fine distinctions? Who is responsible for that? And one of the ways in which he, he helps them to understand how wrong that is is by kind of an ongoing comparison between the apostles, right? The scum scraped off their shoes and the Corinthians. Listen to this. This is, this is fascinating. He says in verse 9, I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all like men sentenced to death. Because we become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. And then, here's the contrast. We are fools for Christ's sake. Right? It was Paul who stood in Athens before the philosophers and was laughed out of the assembly. Right? We are fools for the sake of Christ. He's already said in this letter that the word of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. And that's the very message that he's been standing out in public proclaiming. He says, we are fools. Oh, but you, <laughs> you are wise in Christ. Hmm. We're weak. And he was weak. The little bit of description that we have of Paul's physical appearance comes not from the New Testament, but from later writers who are repeating what they heard. And 
He was not a physically impressive person. And then on top of that, he's working with his hands and he's tired. And then on top of that, he's given up any social status that he may have had earlier in life to be an apostle. So he's weak in a lot of different ways. He says, we are weak, but you're strong. And then he reverses the order for some reason. And he says, you're held in honor. Right? This is a reference back to those. Who's making these distinctions among you? Who's lifting one person up and not another? Who's doing this? And he's saying, you're held in honor. Right? Those differences they're making. You're, you're exalted. You're up here. All the while, we are in disrepute. We're dishonored as apostles. Who's done this? He's asking in verse 7. Well, the answer, obviously, is they've done it to themselves. Nobody came into the church and said, you know, I like this guy, and I like this lady over here, and I like this guy. Nobody's done that. They've done it to themselves. They've sought to elevate themselves and certain members of the church above others. They've done this to themselves. So he knows the answer. He knows they know the answer, but he asks the question anyway so that they will stop and think. Who's making these distinctions among you? And we do this kind of stuff, don't we? Don't we sometimes, if we're not elevating ourselves, then we're trying to elevate someone else around us because we'll benefit from their rising star. We, we do this sort of thing as well. Because we know that this particular individual, we're more in agreement with them. And while we may not have sort of the status or the gifting to have any influence, if we will just nudge them and help them have that influence, then our thoughts, our ideas, our wisdom will be advanced. We do these kinds of things. We do. They're the cause of the divisions among them, no one else. But then he moves on. What do you have, he asks, that you did not receive? Now this, I think, is the key question. What do you have that you didn't receive? Now the obvious answer to this question is nothing. They have nothing of worth or value that they did not receive from the hand of God Himself. I mean, you, can, you can take this back to the fact that they are Christians. I mean, to whom do they owe gratitude for the fact that they are followers of Christ, that they have the gift of eternal life, that, that they have a hope that goes beyond this life. Like All those great, wonderful benefits of being a Christian, who do they have to thank for all of those things? The gospel of Jesus Christ would say, you have only God to thank. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul summarizes the gospel in this way. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's Paul's summary of the gospel message. Jesus died for our sins. That is in our place. The forgiveness that we enjoy does not come to us because we were such of such value and worth to God that He decided to overlook our failures. No. He did not overlook our failures. He did not simply pass by and ignore your sins or mine. Jesus willingly went to the cross and paid the penalty for our sins. That's the gospel. That's the first half of the gospel message. That He, for our sins, died. And so the forgiveness that we enjoy, the freedom that we live out of, because we're not living under the crushing weight of the guilt of our sin, doesn't come to us because of anything that we have done. It comes as a gift because Jesus has already done everything necessary. The life that we hope in. The life that moves beyond the graves that are scattered around this world. 
comes to us because Jesus was raised on the third day. He goes on, we saw this last week, he goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 to say that Jesus is the first fruits. That is, he's the beginning of the harvest and all those who belong to him will be raised up. They will enjoy the same kind of fruitful, eternal life that Jesus has through his resurrection. We get that, but we get that and the hope that comes along with that because of Jesus and not anything that we've done. And all of those benefits come to us simply because we trust in one who's done everything to accomplish our salvation. If we stopped there, that would be enough. What do you have that you did not receive? That would be enough. But the Corinthians... And we have so much more. He goes on a little bit to describe them as saying, you've already become rich, you're wealthy. And he doesn't mean that in the physical sense of the term. We know that because he says there there aren't very many people of noble status among you. There's not very many rich people in the church at Corinth. No. When he says you've already become rich, he means spiritually wealthy and rich. He says that in the very first chapter, in the opening. He says in verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him, right? In every way you were enriched, you were made spiritually wealthy in Him. But all that is because of the grace of God that was given to you. So whatever spiritual gifts they have that they might boast in, came from God Himself. Whatever spiritual maturity, whatever little bit of true wisdom they might actually possess, is not theirs because they found it and grabbed it with their own two hands. It's theirs because of God's grace that gave it to them. Their salvation, their gifting, their their standing within the body of Christ, The knowledge that they do have that is right and according to God's word. All of those things are because of the grace of God. What do you have that you didn't receive? Nothing. And his third question is where I think we find most of our sort of application today. He says, and if you received it, why? Why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Why do you boast as if these were your own accomplishments? Or more so, because often our boasting is a claim that we deserve something, that we're worthy of something, and so our boasting usually leads to demanding more. Right? If we feel that we have earned some of the good things that we have, if we feel that we have some of these blessings because of things that we've done, then we will naturally look and see other things that we've done and begin to demand more from Him. I deserve better than I've received. I shouldn't be treated in that way by those people. I, I, should, I, should have, I should be in the place where this person is. My kids should be as easy to handle as this person's kids. Or my health. My health should be like their health. I'm the one who ate healthy. I'm the one who exercised. I did all the right things. And they were eating Cheetos. Cheese Whiz. And I don't know. And I have cancer. Or I have heart problems. You see how boasting in the things that you've done as if you've actually accomplished them leads to demanding. Because we are wired both as sinners and honestly just as Westerners and Americans. We're kind of wired to want to insist on what we think is rightly ours. I have a right to something. I've done this, 
and therefore I have a right. And what that demand forgets is that the things that you've received weren't yours because you earned them in the first place. Jesus tells a parable about this. I won't read the whole parable. I'll summarize it. But I want to read the end of it. The parable itself is a parable that Jesus tells about a wealthy farmer. He owns a vineyard. And he needs people to work in his vineyard. And so he goes out early in the morning and he hires some workers. Right? So when I was a kid, I grew up in Dayton. And there was a place that you could go to in Liberty... You could drive there, and there would always be men standing outside a particular store waiting for work. And there were times when my dad, it wasn't often, but there were times when he had things that needed to be done that my brother and I were probably not old enough or strong enough to do on our own. And there were just two or three times, but I remember going over there, and he would hire a couple of guys, and they would come back with us, total strangers, it was weird, and they would do some work. But they stood out there all day waiting. And so that's kind of the picture that Jesus is painting. There's just sort of some itinerant workers waiting for work. And so this wealthy farmer goes out early in the morning in the story that Jesus tells. And he hires some workers and he says, Come work for me, I'll give you a denarius for a day's work. Not bad, not bad pay. They agree, they're going to come working. A few hours later, the farmer needs more workers and he goes out and he gets a few more workers. And then a little later, he needs more workers, and he goes out and he brings some more workers in. Toward the end of the day, day's almost done, he goes out for some reason and hires some more workers right at the end of the day. So you have people that have worked all day long in the heat for their denarius. And then you have people that worked a little less, then people who worked like half a day. And then you have some people who really worked like the last like hour when the sun was already setting and it wasn't even as hot anymore. And at the end of the day, this wealthy landowner gives everybody there a denarius. And they're incredulous. They're frustrated. Verse 12, they said, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. I mean, I, would, I can understand that argument. I'm not unsympathetic to these guys in the parable. But then he replies, friend, which is, that in itself is gracious, that he refers to them as friend. Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. In other words, you didn't deserve to be hired and paid a denarius. I could have left you out there. You'd have made nothing. You'd have gone home, head down. Come into your wife. Didn't work today. Couldn't find any. We're probably going to run out of food this week. Like, that could have been the case. I've not done you any wrong. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? And then here's Jesus' comment. This is his whole interpretation of the parable. I like it. So the last will be first and the first the last. We have a tendency like these workers to convince ourselves that we deserve something that we deserve something more and Paul is saying if everything you have a value was a gift don't boast as if it weren't which will lead to demanding that you have more that you receive more what the Corinthians are failing to do and what we often fail to do is to remember what grace really is. If you remember what grace really and truly is, you won't boast. You won't boast. Your forgiveness, your hope, your life, your family, your home, 
your job, everything you have, was given to you by grace. But, but I worked hard, but I went to school, but I, really? Because you had an opportunity to go to school. I mean, you were born into a place, perhaps to a family, or at least in a setting, in a situation in which that was an option open to you. The vast majority of people in the world do not have that. Well, yeah, but I worked harder than everybody else at my job. Where did the energy come from each day to work hard? Where did the, from where did the drive come? You have nothing that you didn't receive. Everything. Everything in the life of God's people is grace upon grace. So why? Why would you boast as if you hadn't received it? And why? Why would you demand, act as if you were owed even more? Verse 8, this is the last thing. He says, already you have all you want. You, you have it all. Already you've become rich. Without us, you have become kings. Now, if we pause right there, it almost sounds as if Paul is guilty of the very thing he's telling them not to do. It sounds like there's, like when you read those verses, you take them out of context, it sounds like he's jealous. Without us, you've become kings. You've got everything, guys, and we've got nothing. That's what it sounds like. No. He says, and would, or I wish, but it would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. In other words, Paul's not writing this to bring them down a notch because he's jealous of them. He's not writing this out of some sense of anger and spite because he wants to be more highly honored among them. No, Paul's attitude is always, for the churches that he has started and for the people that he's led to Christ, his attitude is always, I want, I want it all for you. Would that you did reign, because that's only good for me. That should be our attitude toward other believers. It should not be, they have things that I should have. They have a life that I should have. They have an ease that they're living in that I've never enjoyed or that I, it's been so long I've forgotten what it is. That, that should never be our attitude. But when we see other Christians receiving additional grace gifts, it should not be, I want that. But it should be, oh, that they would receive it and receive more. Because in the body of Christ... The primary beneficiaries of God's grace is not those who directly receive it, but it's those through whom it's channeled. I want you to receive a whole lot of God's grace. I want you to be gifted. I want this church to raise up teachers and preachers that are far better than I am. Because I would reign with you through that. When you look and you see the blessing of God in another person's life, your reaction should be, oh, that they would receive that grace because I know God channels His grace to others in the body of Christ through His people so that if they benefit, in the end I, I benefit. So God, shower your blessings and grace upon the people around me. If we would but remember the grace of God, there would be no more boasting, there would be no more competition, and all glory would go to the giver. Let's pray.